find that there the Muslim girls are not going to the labor market. Because of social cultural factors, Muslim girls are at the lower level. Muslim boys go to the labor market, but the girls are staying back at home. Uh, but the unemployment rate for them is very high. I'll just discuss that a little later. Which community reports highest female workforce participation rate? They drop out of the school and go to the labor market. It's the scheduled tribe population. You see the graph curve, which is at the higher level in the rural areas is for the scheduled tribe population. Scheduled tribe girls drop out of the school and go to labor market, whereas the Muslim girls are dropping out and staying at home or not entering the labor market. We go to the next one. This is for 2011-12, the same story which comes. Now there is a concept, we go to the next one, which is nowhere children. Children who are neither in the labor market nor at the school. Now they say that this youthful population who are neither engaged in the labor market nor in the school can have social problems. They can get into drugs, they can get into you know, all kinds of you know, sexual behavior or maybe uh, get into acts of violence. You find that Shidul tribe and Muslim boys have a very high percentage of the boys who are neither in the school nor in the labor market and we go to the rural and urban areas, we find the same picture. This is for 2004-05 National Sample Survey data. Population census data does not give the social religious group wise breakdown to do this detailed analysis. Go to the next, uh, please. You find the same picture for 2011-12 as far as the boys are concerned. There's a large percentage of Muslim boys, both in the rural and urban areas, along with scheduled tribe persons who are neither in the labor force nor in the school. But as far as the girls are concerned, go to the next one, you find that uh, Muslim girls are also very much outside the labor force and outside this educational institution. They're at the top and that is something which is a matter of anxiety. Just go to the next one. This is for 2011-12 for the girls. I do not want to get into the details because I want to raise one or two questions with you so that we can have a discussion. You know, the point that I want to share with Dr. Gafur is that whether the Gujarat model of development will work in other states or not, whether that can be replicated is a big question mark. But I must tell you, the Kerala model of education has been applauded all over the country. And most people think that the Kerala model of development can have a lot of things that have to be learned at the national level. Kapoor Sahib, Gujarat model has a big ambassador. That's my namesake, Mr. Amitabh Bachchan. But Kapoor Sahib, let me tell you, Kerala model has a much bigger ambassador. You don't know him. Kerala model has the... I mean, to my mind, the biggest ambassador and the best ambassador, and that is Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen has said, Kerala, he said before 20 years, Professor Sen was my teacher, my PhD supervisor, long time back when he was in Delhi School of Economics. He said, Kerala can be compared with China or any other developed country as far as educational attainments are concerned. So you should not be very pessimistic, you know, I have a feeling that this model has been taken to the, you know, mainstream and also at the global level. Let me come to some of these educational indicators, outcome indicators. I mean, I was really worried when uh, Gafursa was talking about the quality of the private institutions, quality of the minority institution, how commercialization has come in, which has brought in communalization. Some of the outcome indicators, despite all the efforts by the civil society organization seems to be somewhat disturbing. And that's the message that I want to leave with you. We go to the next uh, graph. You see, level of literacy for persons aged six and above. Do you see that the Muslim literacy is not the lowest? 72% compared to SCST, which is 66%. The red pillar, which is for the latest year, 2011-12, and it is slightly less than the average in 2011-12, but Muslim literacy level is slightly better than scheduled 
a scheduled tribe population. I will raise a question with that regard. Can we go to the next one? This is current attendance in the schools. We find Muslims are doing much worse than the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population. Look at Muslims attendance is something like, you know, 50. Uh, current attendance of the children for the Muslims is something like, uh, sorry, I can't see from here, 67%. It is less than Hindu OB OBCs, of course, it's much less than that. But current attendance for the children in 6 to 14 years age group in 2011-12 is less compared to scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population. Look at the next one. This is children who never attended any school and the tallest bar is for the Muslim OBCs and the Muslim population report even higher rate of non-attendance in the schools compared to scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population. Go to the next one. Children 6 to 4 currently not attending any educational institution. Here also you find that scheduled Muslims and the scheduled caste are more or less at a similar level. Basically the question that I'm raising is, can we go to the next one? Well, this is the uh, health I would like to bring it, go back to the earlier one. You see the question that I'm raising is the following. If you take the current attendance in the school, not attending the school takes six to, you know, six to 14 years. You find Muslim boys and girls are doing badly together. Boys, girls difference is not very high, but nonetheless, the Muslim children are doing worse in terms of current attendance. But if you take 15 years plus literacy rate, or in the workforce, you know, in, in the elderly age group, the Muslims do slightly better. Percentage of Muslim literates am, among 20 plus is higher compared to scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population. But the current attendance rate for the Muslims are less. How do you explain this paradox? How come Muslim children who are getting a lower level of you know, educational input now reports, if you take the 20 plus population, a higher level of literacy? Basically, our explanation in the committee is that the benefits of reservation, which has been taken by scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population, has resulted in the current situation improving. But that benefit was not there before 20 years. That's why scheduled caste and scheduled tribe show a lower level of literacy. Whereas present level, the Muslims are doing badly. So I would therefore think that the reservation in the educational institution for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population gave them an edge, which has not been given to the Muslim population. And that is why you find that earlier, Muslims are doing as badly as the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population, but you know, present situation has become somewhat worse. Now, there are a couple of things that I wanted to mention before I close my presentation. I will be very happy to have your questions. Why is it that the Muslim boys and girls are dropping out from the educational system? That is the key question. National Sample Survey has identified three factors. Three factors which are responsible for dropping out, which are the major factors. First, parents not interested in education. Second, education not considered to be relevant. And the third factor is financial reasons. I would like to give you the statistics for you to make the judgment. Parents not interested in education, among the Muslims, 24% of them are reporting. Parents' unwillingness is the factor. But what is the general overall is 25%. So you can't say that the Muslim parents are less interested than the average of the country. As far as education not considered relevant, 11% of the children said that their parents thought that the education is not relevant. But overall figure is 12%. So again, you can't say that it is the unwillingness of the community which is responsible for dropping out. The third factor is financial factor. 
29% of the Muslim families say the children drop out because of financial reasons, whereas the average is 22%. This is 2011-12. So it is very clear that is the financial reason, which is the basic factor why the children are dropping out, and the children are required in the labor market. Now, I'll give you another, another interesting statistics. For the six which are report, who are reporting, sorry, I don't want to really make this kind of a comparison across groups, but it is an interesting thing which strikes out. Six are doing, in terms of per capita consumption expenditure, much better, at least 40% higher than the Muslim population. In terms of consumption expenditure, six report higher figure than the average, both in rural and urban areas. And the Sikh families, 32% of them said we are not, parents are not interested in education, much higher than the average of 25%, which really means that the Sikh families consider other opportunities being available. The parents are not interested because there is a family business which is available which will give them a better return. And I'm not worried about it. If children drop out because there is a, some other employment opportunities. Similarly, education not considered relevant. For Muslims, I gave a figure of 11%. For six, it's a figure of 18%, which really means that dropping out of education system in a way for six are helping them economically, but Muslim children dropping out is largely because of the financial reasons. And I would like to mention, I looked at the unemployment rate for different social religious groups, and you find that the unemployment rate, both for the boys and girls, both in the rural and urban areas, I don't want to really bore you with a lot of graphs. You please take it and read in the report which is available. We find that the unemployment rate for the Muslims are higher much higher than the national average, which really means that even when they are dropping out of the education system, they are not in a position to get into the labor market because unemployment rate is very high and a large percentage of the Muslims are coming into self-employment category. They are, these are all poverty-induced. They are trying to do something for survival. And what, what really bothers me, and this is something that you should uh, you know, you should really find out from the grass reality, and uh, there are many of you who are working at the field level, Muslim girls' unemployment rate reported in the rural areas, especially who uh, have got their high, high school education, is very high, which really means that the Muslim girls are wanting to come out and join the labor market. The employment opportunities are not there. Similarly, for the in the urban areas, Muslim boys who have got higher secondary plus education, their unemployment rate is about 60% higher than the national average, which really means that there are, there's a huge demand in the labor market and Muslim girls and the boys, both of them are reporting higher, much higher levels of unemployment as compared to the average population. I just want to conclude by presenting one issue on which I think we have to do some amount of thinking. Our Vice Chancellor Saab ne Shahid sahab jate jate kaha, hume kuch apne man mein bhi manthan karni chahiye. We have to think how to organize ourselves. I just want to present one very interesting and I think a disturbing statistics for your consideration. I don't want to get into the health issues because this is a seminar on education. But I want to sh quickly share uh, the results that we got in the health sector. We found that the access of the Muslim households the health facilities, government health facilities, primary health centers, maternity care centers is less compared to the average. Because of their location, because perhaps some other factors we were told, but our report was based on secondary data, but we were informed that perhaps Muslim ladies who when they go to the family planning center, they are taunted at. There can be reasons, but we do find that the access of the Muslim households to the health facilities is less even compared to scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population. But overall health performance of the Muslim woman is better than the overall health performance of the Hindu woman. That is something which is a big news. The committee was surprised at how come Muslim life expectancy for the poor and for the non-poor, we have got life expectancy figures. We find Muslim life expectancy at the same level of income is higher compared to other social religious categories. 
We talk about gender discrimination within the Muslim families. And we do find, yes, Muslim children are dropping out from the schools. That I mentioned much more than the other religious groups. But the overall care, maternity care to the Muslim woman at the same level of income and education. Please, you have to control for education and education. We find that the Muslim women are getting better care and in terms of health facilities, the life expectancy is higher. Infant mortality rate for the Muslim families are less compared to the other scheduled caste, scheduled tribe families or the Hindu families at the same level of income, which really gave an idea that given the same level of medical facilities, a Muslim household converts it into better outcome. Slightly better outcome. I'm not saying there's a huge difference, but nonetheless, given the same level of medical facilities, because of the social, religious factors, the overall outcome in terms of health indicators, particularly in terms of, you know, this is an issue that we were worried about, the gender discrimination within the Muslim households, and the health outcome certainly made us concerned about the fact that Muslim households, women, uh, treatment of women overall, as I said, access to the public government facilities is less, but the overall health facilities available to the Muslim woman is not that bad. How come a Muslim household converts educational inputs to better outcome, sorry, health inputs into better outcome, but educational inputs are not getting in converted into better outcome? These are the last mile problems that a Muslim Dominated district shows a better result in terms of health outcomes, but not in terms of educational outcome. This is a question which we were disturbed, we worked on it, and we said, yes, there are some possibilities of some mobilization within the household, within the community, that educational inputs need to be strengthened. Given the same level of medical faci educational facilities, how come a non-Muslim household gets a better result compared to the other communities, but as far as the health are concerned, Muslim households are doing better. This is one question that certainly came to our mind, and I would like to leave it here so that you can find out that whether there is a last minute problem, social mobilization problem, household level problem, civil society not really taking the educational facilities to the Muslim households. This is an issue, and as far as the reservation issue is concerned, if I have a couple of minutes, just two more minutes, I want to mention that we have suggested, our committee has suggested three major things. One, there should be no distinction in India on the basis of religion. If among Hindu communities, among Buddhist communities, among Sikh communities, certain activities have been considered to be linked with untouchability and they have been given reservation, there is no reason why the same job which is being performed by the Muslim community should not get the same benefit. There should be no discrimination. If the Sikhs, Buddhists, and Hindus have got it, with the same activity, same kind of job if they are doing, that they should get the similar benefits. That's the first recommendation we have made and we hope I have discussed this matter with the concerned uh, ministers. This is something that we believe is non-discriminatory, part of the non-discriminatory approach. Sabka vikash, sabke saath. Uske andar bilkul fit baitta hai. Dusri baat. Diversity index. Hamari yasi khayal hai ki reservation ke zariye, ab, jab globalization ho raha hai, public sector withdraw kar raha hai, private educational institutions aa raha hai, health, में आ रहा है प्राइवेटाइजेशन बहुत तेजी से बढ़ रहा है रिजर्वेशन तो सिर्फ पब्लिक सेक्टर में ही लगता है एंड इन फैक्ट सचर वाज अ विजनरी सचर सेड दैट लुक रिजर्वेशन की स्कोप बहुत कम रहेगी वी सजेस्टेड दैट ऑल इंस्टीट्यूशंस इंक्लूडिंग द प्राइवेट कंपनीज टाटा को हो बिरला को हो रायंस का हो दे शुड ऑल बी सब्जेक्टेड टू अ डाइवर्सिटी इंडेक्स टेस्टिंग इफ योर परफॉर्मेंस इज नॉट गुड इट विल बी पब्लिसाइज्ड इट विल बी पुट इन द you know, public domain, and most 90% of the private companies are having some dealing with the public sector in terms of subcontracting of jobs, in terms of business. There can be some disincentive. We are not saying that they should be debarred, they should be thrown out, not, but they will not be entitled to, for the incentives and disincentives. And this diversity index-based incentive should be given to all institutions. Now, 
The point we are, uh, 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 we are making in our committee, it does not mean that Delhi University must have 14%, because if the population share is 14%, Delhi University must have 14% in every department. That's not what we are saying. We are saying, suppose there's a microbiology department, master's level, how many Muslims were eligible, who were available? Out of that, whether we selected the adequate percentage. So diversity index, not straightforward application of the percentage across the institution. We have to find out at a certain level, if 55% is the cutoff point for certain universities, how many Muslims in that region or in that state were eligible with that percentage point, that data is easily available, and then we judge the institution's performance on the basis of that. Jo sansthayen jo hai, diversity index ko respect nahi karegi, unhe disincentive milega, unko incentive se banchit kiya jaga. Yeh humari dousri suggestion hai. Teesri suggestion yeh hai, ki OBC ke andar ek sub quota bhoat zaruri hai on the basis of social and economic backwardness because there is no level playing field. हमने ये बताया है कि 27 परसेंट जो ओबीसी की बात की जा रही है अलग-अलग स्टेट्स में अलग-अलग हैं तमिलनाडु हैज 30 परसेंट वी सेड दैट वी सेड कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन डज नॉट अलाउ एनी रिजर्वेशन बेस्ड ऑन रिलिजन वी सजेस्टेड दैट विद इन द ओबीसी कैटेगरी देयर शुड बी टू क्लासेस महा यू नो मोस्ट बैकवर्ड ओबीसी एंड नॉन बैकवर्ड ओबीसी ओबीसी बट most backward OBC and others. And what we found that about 60% of the Muslim OBCs will fall in that other category, most backward OBC. And there should be a sub quota, not for the Muslims, but for the most backward OBC. That is the suggestion, which I think is constitutionally possible. These are the three major suggestions, but I would also like to mention that overall uh, climate has to improve, there has to be uh, serious measures taken. I hope the government would be in a position to take those. They have to be initiated. There has been, luckily, no major riots uh, in the last few months. And uh, we believe that the Muslim community needs some kind of an assurance of, of you know, belonging, of some kind of an uncertainties and insecurity sense which has come up. That has to be addressed. And that, I think, is one of our recommendations, beside the three major recommendations that have given. And uh, as I said, we are hopeful. I have heard from the ministry that they are under serious consideration. Would like to wait and see what steps are taken. Thank you very much for this question, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for thought-provoking and thoughtful words. Thank you very much. And now I call upon Najula sir for word of thanks. The person and the distinguished guests of the this morning session and the uh, distinguished uh, audience, I, uh, before uh, giving a formal word of thanks, I would like to apologize for the delay in the starting of the program. Because of that, we could not have the uh, uh, question of the session immediately. But I hope that uh, in the tea break and also after coming back also, we will have in the next session, we will like to have some discussion on these two lectures also which are very enlightening and very thought-provoking and uh, really it has given a good start to our uh, this uh, two-day seminar and I would like to, to be formally, I would like to thank the Ministry of Minority Affairs which has uh, given us a, a grant for conducting this seminar and I am also equally thankful to our Vice Chancellor who has been very encouraging in conducting the seminar and also he has given us equal grant for the conducting this seminar. And uh, I thank Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Khaja M. Shahid Sahab. He has been very supporting. Whenever we had problems, small to big, we used to rush to him and he was solving it. And uh, he was always welcoming. And he has actually suggested many uh, uh, things for us. Now we were able to invite uh, guest speakers and all that with his help. I thank him very much. And I also thank uh, the chief guest of this uh, session, Professor Amitabh Kundu sir. Sir, I thank you very much on behalf of the Department of Political Science and Public Administration, as well as of the University of uh, Hyderabad. Really, you are uh, coming to this Hyderabad has uh, evoked very good response, and there are many people inquiring about this because uh, of the Kundu report and all that. And I think uh, really this will seminar will lead to a good discussion and a very valuable uh, report you have presented on post-SHR implementation and we hope it will 
be taken seriously after this and will really bring some needed and required change in the conditions of the Muslim minorities uh, as, the, uh, as far as the implementation is concerned. And I think this seminar will also help in highlighting this. And uh, I'm also very thankful to Dr. Fadil Ghafoor. He has given a very insightful lecture on, and also very um, uh, practical things which are happening in Kerala, which can be replicated in other states. And uh, there is no reason that uh, other states can also follow and stood fast in uh, at least empowering Muslim ed educationally and minorities particularly. Not only Muslims, Christians also constitute a big chunk of Kerala population and there they have shown that being minority is not a very disadvantageous thing and this can also we have been presented very uh, ably in your presentation, sir. I thank you very much for this, for accepting our invitation and also for giving this in. I also thank all the audience, particularly uh, senior professors and also uh, distinguished uh, guests who are coming, came from outside, particularly Sayyid uh, Amin Jafri, MLC, who has come to attend this uh, seminar, and also all other participants from uh, outside, uh, from Hyderabad, and also our delegates who have come from all parts of the country, Assam, Kashmir, Kerala, UP, Bihar, Maharashtra, and also Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. So I thank each one of you uh, for uh, coming to this seminar and participating in these debates. And I hope these deliberations and discussions will really be uh, helpful in uh, furthering the cause of the minorities' education and also making some impact on the policy making in future. And uh, I also thank the head of the department for uh, inspiring and supporting us in all these, conducting these programs, and also my colleagues, uh, Shabanath Farin, Khurshid Alam, Dr. Dastagir Basha, and Dr. Abdul Khayyum Saab, Associate Professor, and also my friend Dr. Ishtia Khamad, and all our staff, and also IMC staff who have been here to covering this program, and also the library staff, the engineering staff, and all the university non-teaching staff who have been supporting in conducting this program. I expect the same kind of uh, support for the coming two, these, uh, two days also. And uh, with this, I thank each one of you for being par participating here and also being very patient with the delay and all that. Now we will be breaking shortly for uh, five minutes for tea. And the second session is also has been shortened for you. And we will be breaking for lunch at two o'clock. I wish all of you be with us for tea and also for lunch. And we will be having a short break for five, five minutes or at the most 10 minutes. We'll come back and have a session for one hour only. So by two, we'll break. Thank you very much. Thank you.